Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this lunchtime's session looking at the accessible information regulations and the support grant for bus operators. Uh, I'm Tim Rivett. I'm going to uh, be uh, taking you through the uh, regulations and the grant this afternoon. Um, we are recording this and we'll share the recording and the slides with you and everybody else that has registered for today uh, in the next day or so. Um, and um, we do welcome questions as we go through, as I'm presenting, if you put them in the chat um, and I'll uh, pick them up at the end um, and uh, we can then uh, open up the verbal uh, Q&A uh, at the end. So um, thank you for coming. Um, we're going to have a look this lunchtime at why the regulations have been brought in, um, do a run through of the key points of the regulations uh, and then look at the support that's available um, and then open up for Q&A. So why are we, uh, why has the Department of Transport introduced regulations uh, for accessible information? Um, Travel is, uh, as I'm sure you're aware, a high anxiety experience, particularly if you're traveling somewhere that you're not familiar with. Uh, if it's dark uh, and wet and the bus windows are steamed up and dirty and that sort of thing. Um, now, imagine uh, you have a visual disability or a hearing impairment. Uh, you've got a learning disability then just uh, imagine the additional effort and the additional anxiety that you have to uh, put yourself through to make a bus journey. Um, now, it's particularly important to make life as easy as possible for people with disabilities um, because they will be much less likely to have access to alternative forms of transport they generally have a lower income uh, and uh, make far fewer uh, journeys than uh, people without disabilities. Um, in a 2014 survey that the Guide Dogs for the Blind carried out, 70% um, of people that had asked the driver uh, to tell them uh, when they got to a particular stop, 70% of people had missed their stop because the driver had forgotten. Um, and uh, I mean, you know, drivers have a lot to do uh, as well as remember to cater with for people's requests like that and that sort of thing. Um, and nearly 70% of the respondents said that they'd use the bus more frequently if audio visual announcements were provided on board. So um, you know, there's, there's evidence from that survey and plenty of other uh, work that's been done and a lot of anecdotal uh, evidence that uh, providing audiovisual announcements is beneficial. Um, London, um, for those of you that have made a trip on a London bus in the last 15 years or so, you will have seen and heard audiovisual announcements. Uh, they introduced it for uh, accessibility reasons, but also uh, to help people that are visitors to the city um, or making journeys that they don't normally make, just making those journeys easier uh, and less anxiety ridden. Um, if you've been on new rolling stock, um, I know there's not a lot of it around on the railways, but if you've been on new rolling stock that's been introduced since 1998, then you will also see uh, next stop displays and audio announcements. So um, it's been introduced in London and the rail network for many years now. Um, and the last set of figures that are available from the department to the end of 2023, um, in England, 49% of vehicles had got audio visual, um, but take away the uh, the London experience and uh, and you're down at 29% of vehicles. 
Wales 37, Scotland 35%. So operators are beginning to introduce audiovisual uh, equipment of their own volition, but there's a long way to go and um, it's much less likely to be in place in rural areas and on low frequency services. And so as a result, the department decided that uh, they needed to uh, move things along and encourage uh, the adoption by introducing these regulations, which were uh, agreed by Parliament last year, last March, um, and kicked in um, in October last year. Um, and we'll uh, we'll have a look at um, what they require. So. Um, at a high level, they require pretty much every local bus or coach service to provide audio announcements and visual information that identifies the route and um, the upcoming stops and some additional information like diversions and uh, hail and ride and things like that. So um, it's applicable. Um, Unlike some of the other recent legislation around open data, uh, this is applicable in England, Scotland and Wales. There are some exemptions which we'll have a look at in a second, but this is England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and um, it applies where you're operating a local bus service. So that's not a registered local bus service, that's a local bus service. So if you've got, for example, a rail replacement that's doing short hops between stations on a branch line, for example, uh, then uh, that journey is uh, almost certainly going to be in scope. If you've got longer distance rail replacement, then um, if more than half of the route is local, so you can get on and off paying a separate fare uh, within 15 miles, then um, as long as less than half of that um, rail replacement comes under local, um, then you'd be all right. You know, the, the route the CPT you know, uses as an example is if you've got a rail replacement from uh, Newcastle to London and you stop off in Gateshead and Durham and uh, a few places right at the start, um, then that would be in scope. But because you then go uh, long distance without stops uh, down to, to York and then London, for example, um, then you know those short stops are less than half of the route. And so therefore you don't need to provide it for that. But if you've got a local stopping service, you do. Um, but if you've got a registered bus service running um, local, then uh, you're in scope um, and um, it's the vehicle that's in scope, not the uh, whether it's the type of service. Um, so it's applicable for a different set of vehicles to PSVR. There's no relationship to those requirements. Um, so uh, small vehicles, 17 seats and under are out of scope. So if you've got 18 seats, you're in scope. If you've got 17 seats, you're in scope. Um, if you've got 16 seat minibus, then your that vehicle is out of scope. Um, if it's what these days is called a heritage vehicle, first used before 1973, then you don't need to worry about it, although you could still fit it. Um, if you're an excursion on a tour, if you're closed door home to school service, long distance service, um, those are all out of scope. Um, but likewise, any part of a service that's demand responsive, or if you've got a bit of flexible service in the middle of a fixed route, then um, you're not going to know what stops you're going to visit and things like that. And so uh, there's a uh, derogation for those. Um, and generally, nine, section 19 and 22 
are out of scope unless you've got a new vehicle um, so after October last year. So um, it, because it's vehicle based, um, the uh, implementation deadlines are based on the age of the vehicle. So uh, any shiny new vehicle that you've got from uh, October this year uh, has to have it in place from first use. Um, vehicles that are five years old in October, you're going to have to have it fitted by uh, October this year. Um, so retrofit um, and until you get to uh, 2026, you're OK for uh, for your oldest vehicles. Um, so when we talk about first use, what does that mean? That is first use on a local bus service. Uh, if you've acquired a vehicle second hand from another operator, then it's not when you first used it, it's when that vehicle was first used. Um, so uh, you might need to do some uh, some digging around to find out when it was first used on a local bus service. Um, there is a uh, some questions that album are raising with the department around what happens if you've bought a second hand vehicle in uh, from uh, Ireland or Isle of Man. Um, when does first use apply for that? Um, is it when it was first used in this country or whether it was when it was first used um, for an equivalent thing um, you know, from the country that you've acquired it from? Um, so um, introduced on a cascading basis based on the age of the vehicle. Um, we've seen the 29% of vehicles um, in March last year had equipment on board. Um, if you're in that situation, um, if you'd got equipment on vehicle before October last year, um, then uh, as long as you're providing audio and visual information, then you can uh, class it as a partially compliant vehicle. You don't have to meet all of the requirements. So if you don't make a um, bing when you come to a diversion and things like that, uh, an alert, then um, you know you, those sort of finer points. But as long as you've got audio and visual information on board, you can class yourself as partially compliant and you've got until in that situation October 2031 to make that fully compliant. Um, however, if something goes wrong with that equipment and you need to um, upgrade things because, you know, the display stopped working or something like that, then you need to um, start again and make sure that what is uh, refitted is uh, fully compliant. Um, so in terms of what you need to provide for audio, you need to be providing um, announcements that are intelligible for 51% of passengers when they're seated. Um, it's got to be uh, three decibels or more over the background noise to make it allow it intelligent. Um, there is a, it shouldn't be louder than 84 decibels limit, um, which on some older vehicles, um, when you're going uphill, fully laden, um, uh, the, the, the level of noise at the back seat, something like that might be a bit of an issue, um, but 84 decibels uh, is, a, is a limit because that is the limit in health and safety legislation. Um, and so uh, that's worth just bearing that in mind. You know, if at the front of the bus the noise is greater than 84 decibels, then you need to be thinking about, or not just thinking, putting in place hearing protection for your drivers. Um, so um, that's where the 84 decibels comes from. Um, top deck and bottom deck, if you're a decker, um, and um, the recommendation is that you test the intelligibility uh, at five miles an hour and 20 miles an hour. So this isn't just a static 
uh, in the depot with the engine running. This is actually, you know, when you're out and about actually running routes, uh, what is the customer experience going to be? Um, in addition to audio information through speakers, you also need to provide um, audio through induction loops. And this is something that is um, new to a lot of operators. Um, some TFL buses have had it for a few years and a few others, but it's uh, this is the sort of the new bit um, in many ways. Um, you need to provide that induction loop in the uh, priority and wheelchair space areas. Um, ideally, it's across the whole floor plate, um, but recognising that um, installing the cabling necessary for induction loops is challenging. Um, a minimum requirement is priority and wheelchair space. Um, and you also need to provide appropriate signage in the uh, coverage areas as well. So that's the audio um, visual. You need to provide information through a display um, to 51% of seated passengers on obstructed uh, top and bottom deck. Um, so uh, if you've got standing room only um, you know, and the bus is rammed at peak times, then um, you know, it's not making sure that everybody can see at that point it's when people, everybody is sitting no standing 51 percent of seated is unobstructive now that might mean a bit of tweaking and thinking about where the uh, display is sighted particularly in the lower deck if you've got lots of uh, grab handles and things like that um, uh, if you've got a bulkhead with stairs on on a double decker uh, you know, you might need to have a uh, a bit of a think and a bit of a play with uh, where it goes to achieve that. But uh, on pretty much every bus uh, out there, that shouldn't be a problem um, with a bit of thought. Um, there are requirements for minimum height. So it's got to be at least 22 millimetres uh, text um, and um, you can't use all uppercase and things like that because that's uh, harder for people with visual impairments and learning disabilities to uh, to read. Um, there are um, some um, other little bits and bobs that are um, we'll not look at today but the key thing with the displays is it's technology agnostic the regulations don't specify whether you use LED or TFT or e-ink or whatever the latest shinest technology is that comes along. Um, you just need to provide the textual information. Um, if you've got a vehicle that's first used after October this year, then you also need to make sure that the information that you're providing is visible to people when they're in the wheelchair bay, which typically means that they're rearward facing um, and seeing as to achieve 51% visibility uh, for seated passengers, you're going to have to have a display that's pointing towards the back of the bus. That means that the uh, the wheelchair user is probably not going to be able to see that um, if they're rearward facing. So you need to have an additional display installed. Um, and that goes for if you've placed an order, you know, two years ago for vehicles that are being delivered um, after October, um, then you're going to need to make sure that those are coming uh, equipped with that additional display. Um, so what do you need to provide information wise? You need to provide route information. So the service number or name, um and uh, the destination where it's going to if it's a circular service or um you know uh, something like that then uh, give people an indication of which way around the loop that they're going um the objective of this is somebody boarding uh, can have confidence that they're on the right route and they're going in the right direction um and so to achieve that you need to provide that information when the vehicle stopped as people are boarding um, only when you've stopped. 
Um, and um, before you get to the last stop along a route, you need to provide an alert noise to wake people up and let them know that it's the last stop uh, and it's time to get off. Uh, when you're going along the route, you need to provide information about every scheduled stopping place, whether or not you stop there, um, the name that you uh, use needs to reflect what they might have seen either on street or in a journey planner or leaflet. Um, so, you know, there might be some coordination with other operators and authorities. Uh, so, you know, I know that NAPTAN stop names to the national database of, uh, of bus stops, the names there sometimes. Um, there can be a bit of debate, but um, that's the recommendation would be to use that because that should be pretty consistent then across all of the customer outputs. Um, if you're, uh, if you've got um, alternative names and disagreements and things like that, then uh, use the um, uh, enhanced partnerships that you're almost certainly a member of these days. Uh, to tackle uh, stop naming um, because uh, it does need to have that consistency. Um, on urban routes, um, as you're leaving a city, you, know, you might be travelling at you know, full road speed um, on the way out. So, you know, 20, 30 miles an hour, if you've got stops on a regular basis along that road, um, you might need to uh, tweak when the next stop announcements are made to make sure that you can announce them all in time for people to go, ah, that's the stop I want, press the button and the driver stop without having to do an emergency stop. Um, likewise, if you've got long distances between stops on rural roads, for example, um, you might want to um, announce the next stop information as you depart the last one, but then have a reminder just before you uh, get to that stop, because, you know, if you've got two, three, four minutes between stops, you know, people aren't necessarily going to um, press the button immediately um, or think about, well, when do I need to uh, to get off? So might need to think about some of those reminders. Um, hail and ride. Um, obviously, you don't know where you're going to drop people off and pick people up along a hail and ride section. Um, so um, the requirement is that you uh, announce the fact that you're starting a hail and ride and ending a hail and ride. You need to provide an alert for that. Um, and uh, if it's a long stretch of hail and ride, you might also want to uh, think about providing uh, additional location identification, you know, so um, uh, we're just passing through this village where, you know, about uh, there's these crossroads and, you know, the side road and things like that to help people um, you know, just be aware of where they are and where they might need to uh, press the uh, the stop button to uh, to get off. Um, but the minimum requirement is notifying people of the start and the end point. Um, diversion information, this is the one that's causing um, probably the most thought uh, for people at the moment. So you need to inform passengers when you're going on diversion. Again, you need to have a, an alert to wake people up and get them to uh, to listen. The minimum requirement is to announce that you're going uh, on a diversion uh, and uh, when you're back on route, uh, ideally you will provide some more information about you know, where the diversion is going, what stops them, you're missing out or roads and that sort of thing. Um, but and um, yeah, you might be able to plan this. Um, if you know about it in advance, program it in. So actually, you don't need to um, provide that we're going on a diversion. Uh, you know, the the announcements and things like that will follow the uh, the, the route 
acceptably. Um, but you're always going to come across a situation where you, you know, you turn a corner and um, the road's closed because there's been a water main burst or something like that, and you need to go on a diversion. So um, you can't always program that in this in. So drivers need to have some way of triggering that alert. Um, if you're, I think this is one of those situations where you will probably start to see more updates to routes and timetables you know typically you might re-register a route if you know there's going to be diversion for you know, six months or a year something like that but uh, if it's a couple of weeks or a month you're probably not um, but this is one of those where um, you might need want to be updating your BODS data and updating the route um, information on journey planners and things like that. Uh, to, so effectively, then it's not a diversion um, and you don't need to worry about alerts and drivers getting involved and things like that. So uh, so think about that as a uh, as a potential solution for some of the uh, some of the medium term diversions that you might come across. Um, it should be said, uh, it's worth saying um, that whenever information is announced either on the screen or uh, on audio, it needs to match. Um, you know, it's no good providing information on the screen and not announcing it through the speakers because you know, if somebody uh, is unable to see the screen, they're reliant on the audio information and vice versa. Um, once you've got this fitted, you need to keep on top of maintenance. Um, so uh, you need to keep your routes up to date. If you change routes, you're going to need to update the audio visual system to reflect that route change. Um, and you're also going to need to check that the equipment's working. Uh, uh, it's fairly easy to see whether a display is working and uh, find out whether announcements are being heard through the speakers, um, but you need to have an audit trail uh, for that because it is a requirement to have this operating. So you need a maintenance regime in place if things stop working. Um, the audio and visual is relatively easy to test, as I say. The um, more challenging one is hearing loop because unless you're driver or engineers have got a hearing aid with a T-switch on, you're not going to know whether the hearing loop's working or not. And so recommendation is that you're uh, testing this uh, on a regular basis, not necessarily every day as part of daily checks, uh, but you know, every week, uh, every month as part of the, you know, the, 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 the maintenance checks and things like that you know, on a regular basis and again, have that documented because when somebody says it's not working, if you've not tracked that back, you know, or not dealt with it because it's not been working for, you know, a couple of months, then uh, that's the sort of thing, the compliance thing that the DVSA might be interested in. Um, we'd also suggest that you make sure that your um, reporting process for passengers is right. Uh, you might not get very many vehicle faults being raised by passengers, but once you've got audio visual on board, it's much more obvious to passengers than if you've got a brake fault or something like that, or an engine overheating and that sort of thing. So um, think about how passengers can report faults and how you're going to fix them um, and how drivers uh, might pick up on some of those as well. So, at this point, has anybody got any questions about the regulations? Um, it was quite a quick run through, I recognise. Andrew. Yeah, just going back to the uh, services that are in scope and aren't, going back to the rail replacement, you mentioned there about local services, clearly, you know, Northern Rail Service, for instance, that's got stops within 15 miles they're falling within scope that's fairly clear on the longer distance services the the exemption that allows for um 
the 50 percent if for instance you had a um a service that had two stops maybe i don't know hold to london for instance and it might have the the whole to Bruff section, for instance, that's within 15 miles, so that falls within scope. Are we saying that the the 50 percent is calculated on the total journey, i.e., the rail and the bus, or just the bus section? Uh, I believe it's just the bus section. Yeah, no, that's fine. I just wanted to be clear on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's check with DVSA, but it's going to be just the bus section. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, that's fine. OK, so that's the regulations. We've got another opportunity for Q&A in a bit. Um, so um, whenever government introduce some regulations or new laws, they have to do an impact assessment looking at who's going to benefit, who's going to be impacted uh, and the pros and cons of uh, those regulations. As part of that work, uh, the Department of Transport identified that smallest operators would have the largest impact uh, from the introduction of these regulations. Uh, if you've got two or three buses um, and you need a back office to manage the data and you know the the routes and keep those up to date, for example, um, or you need to uh, train an engineer to look after things uh, that you've got far less resources than an operator that also needs to do that that might have 100 vehicles um, and smallest operators typically will also have fewer financial resources as well um, and as a result of that the department of transport um, have um, asked artig to manage a grant for them targeted at the smallest operators um, and so uh, we're in the process of administering that on behalf of the department. Um, so when we talk about smallest operators, we are talking small, uh, 20 or fewer in scope service vehicles. Um, you can't have more than oper more operating licenses than 20 in scope. Uh, so you might have more than 20 vehicles, but you know they might be mini eight-seater minibuses, uh, for example. Um, uh, they're out of scope, um, so we're looking at in-scope vehicles um, and vehicles that uh, you might use them on a um, out-of-scope service, um, uh, a closed-door home-to-school service, for example. But if if they would otherwise be in scope if they were running a you know, registered service, then they also count to your limit. Um, you can't be part of a bigger group um, and um, it's got to, you know, it's got to be in scope um, and you can't also have audio and visual information on board already. Um, applications need to come directly from the operator. We've deliberately made the application process as simple as possible. Uh, this is not a uh, typical uh, DFT um, application process where you need to write war and peace on the benefits and you know the whys and wherefores and, and that sort of thing. Uh, this is pretty simple stuff that we're asking, hopefully stuff that you already know. I'd be worried if you didn't, things like what your company number is, how many vehicles you've got in fleet, what your own license is and, and that sort of thing. Um, so uh, simple stuff. Um, you can um, use the grant to buy equipment so you know, if you need uh, displays speakers hearing loops things like that um, it will to make sure it goes as far as possible um, only fund the minimum specification so i said that the regulations are technology agnostic um, so if you decide you want to install uh, tft displays because you can provide more than the minimum requirement you, know, you can uh, put some advertising on potentially you know um, that sort of thing um, then um, we won't fund the tft um, but we would fund an led because that's you know that's the minimum type of technology that's going to meet the requirements so uh, then um, as part of the process you need to get 
a quote from a supplier for fitting uh, for for the equipment um so in that situation you get a quote for what you want you get a quote for uh led um and we'll fund the led but you just top it up to get what you actually want um you know we're trying to avoid people going for uh, surround sound audio in buses with you know 50 inch plasma and things like that um we will also fund installation and any supporting um infrastructure that you need you know typically you know you might need some uh a bit of software to to manage routes and keep those up to date and things like that um and um first year's maintenance as well um, although i'm aware that most suppliers provide two years warranty as part of it but you know we'll pay for year one um as i say process is really simple get a quote from a supplier um we're not asking for multiple quotes because it's quite a small uh uh supplier base um and uh, we will benchmark costs against uh all the applications so we'll know if there's any outliers to have conversations with you about you know what are the particular circumstances that mean it's going to cost 50 grand to fit this bus when it typically is costing you know two and a half three or whatever it is um fill out a grant claim form which just asks for things like your bank account details and things like that um this grant is classed as a state subsidy um, and so you need to fill out a self-certification form because there are limits on what organizations can get from government over a rolling three-year period so we need to know what other um, subsidies you might have had to make sure that um, neither of us is falling foul of the uh, of the subsidy laws um, and then um, terms and conditions which uh, include things like you've got to keep this equipment on vehicle and maintained for five years after you've had it fitted you know we don't want it um, being taken off and sold after two years um, uh, we will be doing some uh, some compliance checks over the next few years to make sure that kit is being fitted uh, if you change vehicles and things like that then you're going to have to make sure that you know whatever replaces the vehicles that were fitted through the grant also have equipment either through um you know uh taking it off and putting it onto the new vehicle or uh you know making buying new kit for uh the new vehicle in fleet um so hopefully that's okay we're trying to keep those terms as light as possible um applications have been open for a couple of weeks now they close on the 3rd of june um and uh, all being well the department will give us the nod in early july for uh, which of you have been successful um the only fly in the ultimate is if there's a general election in june uh, or early july because whilst this really isn't political decision uh, the civil service might need to decide it's uh, um, a political decision and uh, and not make any uh, announcements but uh, i think it's more likely the autumn by the work you know the conversations that are going on um so uh, should be early july um that is a challenge um for you because um there's not a lot of time between early July and 1st of October if you've got some of the newer vehicles that need to be fitted by uh, October. Um, so you will need to uh, get a move on once you've got that. Um, uh, but um, uh, we know who you are. The DVSA will know who you are. Um, so um, uh, I doubt you would get any compliance um, visits um if you're one of the successful ones um allocation into for the grant um this is targeted at the smallest operators 
Um, and so once we've got all the bids in, uh, we will uh, allocate based on the smallest first. So if you've got one vehicle, uh, you're almost certainly going to get some money. If you've got 18 or 20 and there's been an awful lot of applications, you know, um, so uh, yeah, we'll start with the smallest and, and work up until all the money is gone. Um, there is um, information on how to apply for the grant, the links to the application process and the documentation on the Arctic website. There's a separate, you know, there's a special set of pages which has got we've got guides to the uh, to the regulations and all the stuff about applying for grant and things like that. Um, there is also on there a page with a list of suppliers who let us know that they can supply compliant equipment. Um, we have no you know, uh, links to any of them. They're just ones that have knocked on the door and said, hey, we can supply a compliant kit. If you're a supplier and you're not on that list and you can com supply a compliant kit, let me know um, and I'll add you to the list. Um, if you've got questions and things like that, we've got a dedicated uh, email address. Drop us uh, an email and we'll get back to you uh, very quickly. Um, and if you've not done anything with audiovisual equipment, uh, we've got a report that we've done looking at the sorts of technologies involved and available. Uh, what you need to think about for uh, planning installation and maintenance and things like that. And uh, you might want to get um, you know, some of your user groups involved and disability groups to, you know, uh, make them aware. Uh, all of that sort of stuff is in that uh, report. So hopefully that will make it easier for you if you've not been involved in any of this before. So has anybody got any questions? Aha. Uh -huh. Question, recommended suppliers. So we don't recommend any of the suppliers on the list. They're just ones that have told us that they can supply equipment that meets the requirements. Anybody got any questions, comments, thoughts? Do feel free to drop us an email um, or um, get in touch uh, on the phone if you prefer that. Uh, my personal email address is there as well. Um, yeah, so uh, do feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions uh, afterwards. OK, if there are no oh, we've got a no, I can see somebody typing. Yeah, Donald. Yes, um, we lucky typing, but uh, I'm a two finger kind of a typist. So I think really quiet. Um, <laughs> I'm just wondering really in terms of the. Um, whether there's any sort of data sharing, um, I do. Um, quite a bit of real replacement. I don't know what sort of home to school or, or any other kind of service work now. Um, so obviously, well, I'm in the north of Scotland, so it's obviously ScotRail, but I'm just wondering if any of these companies are, are to, um, to share their data in terms of the routes that they um, that they follow. Obviously, we'll you know, be doing different routes and sort of real replacement. Um, so obviously, they'll have that infrastructure there, if, if that sort of makes sense. So. Yeah, so I mean, if you've got a con, so some operators have contracts to cover rail routes in the event of problems, and so you know what that route's going to be. Um, so you should be able to pre program that in advance. Um, if you've just got a, we'll let you know on the day what the route is type arrangement, then um, yeah, you are going to need to have conversations with whatever the talk is to um you know get them to think about this some of the uh talks are more aware of this requirement 
um, than others because it wasn't originally identified, um, I have to say, um, when the definitions were first created. Um, so some talks are more on top of this than others. Um, if you've got problems with a talk, then um, let me know or let CPT know. Um, so Gav Miller, the uh, operations manager at CPT, is very on this at the moment um, and talking to Network Rail and TOX um, to uh, to make sure that they're aware of the requirements and things like that. Um, OK, that's just probably Andy, I'd reach out to some RHA coaches, but um, I'll, I'll maybe reach out to Abilio as well. They, they coordinate all the coaches on behalf of Scott Rail. Um, so I'll maybe speak to Shark, who's uh, so sort of the head um, bar there to maybe take that conversation forward. Um, yes. So obviously it'll, not, it'll be more than just myself that will be affected, you know, but... Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so already then can be shared. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, Andrew. Hi, Tim. Um, yeah, Tim, can I just ask if if you're fortunate enough to get a positive decision at the end of July, um, being mindful that you have to have all the kit installed by the first of October if you if you're in that eligibility car, uh, category, what happens if you go to suppliers and they're all absolutely flat out doing other installations? This and the other. Is there any dispensation given beyond the first of October? So uh, we already know that at least one supplier is booking installations in for next year because they're full until that point. Um, we also know that some suppliers are training local engineers to do the fitting and things like that. Um, so uh, you know that, that and they'll you know they'll supply the kit and. Uh, provide the training and you then go and install it or you know a local uh, they're certainly talking to some operators about well you've got an engineer but there's a few other operators around you that haven't if we train your engineer can you make them available to to fit so there's a there's a few things like that going on um officially the department have said that um, there's not going to be uh, blanket um, acceptance of, of delays and things like that. Um, and so um, the recommendation would be to evidence what you've done um, and um, then approach the department um, and um, you're unlikely to have a problem if you've uh, made steps to do something. You know, if you've not done anything in uh, mid-September and you knock on the DFT's door and go, you know, please, um, I can't get kit fitted, then you'll get short shrift, I'm sure. But if you've got the evidence that, you know, you've you've been waiting for this um, because this has this grant has been trailed for quite a long time, I'm aware. Um, and, um, you know, you've got quotes from suppliers and fitting dates that are beyond October for the newer vehicles, then uh, then, then they're going to be sympathetic. Right, OK, thanks for that. But and officially, also, they're, they're, officially, they're going to say, no, you have to have it fitted. But, you know, uh, <laughs> we're working very closely with them and they're aware of very aware of the situation. Right. OK, thanks. And also, I've just dropped in the chat box, um, but I'll mention it now. Are you sharing the slides? Yeah, the slides will be shared and and um, we'll share a recording of this uh, of this uh, session as well um, in the next day or so once the video is processed. That's great. Thanks. No, if not, then thank you all for your time this afternoon. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of the day and a good weekend. Thank you for watching this RTIG webinar. To find out more about RTIG and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you.